Gig Gab, episode 253 for Monday, April 20th, 2020. folks and welcome to gig gab the show that's by for and about working musicians as always these days here in durham new hampshire hold away in the studio i'm dave hamilton here in san jose california it's paul kent yep so here we are i i feel like at least for the moment i have successfully gotten over my uh, whatever you want to call it. I, I, I hesitate to use the word de- depression because I know that there's people that suffer from it far, far worse than whatever I'm about to describe. And, and it's a, it's a, you know, a chronic thing and all that, but, but I definitely experienced some depression, uh, grieving perhaps, mm. uh, dealing with the fact that I would not be playing music with humans. I was going to say would not be playing gigs, that, that, of course, is part of it. But I can't even get together with friends and rehearse here. Right. Yeah. And and so that grieving process took me a couple of weeks. Uh, actually, it took me more than a couple of weeks. I thought it took me a couple of weeks. And and during those couple of weeks, I just couldn't bring myself to really even think about playing my drums. Like every time I did, it was like, crap, you know, what's the point of this and all that. Right. And um, and then I had like a, a, a couple of days where I got past that and did some, some recording and then it sort of rekindled again, you know, uh, for a little bit, but now I feel like, uh, you know, I've had consistent, uh, product, product, productive, uh, enjoyable experiences, recording drum tracks, recording vocals. Part of it is that, uh, last weekend, I guess I enlisted my daughter to come be my engineer and producer here in the studio for recording some vocal tracks. Cause I just felt like I, a, it would be something to do together and, and B and perhaps in a different order, maybe it was a was, was that I really felt like I would be able to deliver a better performance if I had someone sort of coaching me and saying, eh, maybe that wasn't so good, you know, um, mm. another set of ears, right? You know, the, the, being that producer and, and really a good producer isn't telling you that's not so good. It's more highlighting, hey, do more of this. This would be great, right? And and it took her a little while to get comfortable with that, but but now now we're in a good routine with it. And so uh, so I've been doing a lot of, of recording and all of that and enjoying it and even looking forward to it. There, there definitely were some times where I came over here and was like, oh, I got to get some tracks done for the fling guys. Russ is going to be, you know, yelling at me in a couple of days if I don't get anything and uh, not yelling, but asking, you know, and uh, it's like, oh, I got to do it. So there was definitely some guilt there, but, but that's okay. Like that, you know, sort of drove me to, to make it happen. And I'm glad that I have, cause now I, now I'm really enjoying it and we're doing some mixing that part's been a little weird the because Russ doesn't uh, I am more comfortable mixing drums than Russ is, but Russ is taking over the mixing of the tracks. So but we can't do that all in the same place like we did last time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's not like I can come and mix the drums and then Russ can sit down in the same chair in front of the same DAW and mix the rest of the stuff. But isn't that not a terribly impractical use of zoom. I mean, isn't that something you could sort of do together enough? There are ways of, of doing that. That's true. We could, we have not done that yet. And that might actually be fun. That might be interesting because there are, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's a, there's a plugin that's sort of related to an online service, man. And I'll, I'll find it. Uh, it might be, yeah, I'm looking, I was, I've, I've found it. It's been there before, but anyway, there's a, a way of of hearing what's coming out of someone else's DAW. I think it might be called Source Connect. Uh, I'll put Source Connect in the um, in the show notes. I might have it completely wrong, but I think it's Source Connect. Somebody mentioned it on our Facebook group at, at giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. Uh, but uh, but I'll put that out there. But it it it's a it's a way of sending high quality audio back and forth in real time, but there's some lag there's, you know, 500 milliseconds of latency or something, but it's not terrible. So we could do that. 
But what instead, thus far, what we've been doing is I will sit here and come up with a drum mix and then I'll send it to Russ as a stereo mm-hmm. file and he'll dump that into his DAW, you know, mix it at an appropriate level, just the stereo file and then send, you know, and then do the rest of his mixing and send it back to me. And and so it's been a, you know, remarkably inefficient process because I'll hear it and it's like, oh, that one Tom needs to be a little louder or, oh, no, the Toms need way more reverb than it sounded like in the studio, which has been an interesting thing. Learning, truly learning about the elements of, oh, like this is what reverb really does, not just adding <laughs> it. Well, it, it's rare that I would in the past, I, w- I would never have like isolated the mix of the drums at the very end of the process, right? It's like, okay, we'll just do this. And maybe I should, because now I'm learning what I want the drums to sound like and what makes them sound good in a mix. So it, I'm learning a lot, which is great, but it's inefficient because, you know, I'll send them mm-hmm. these things, but it's fun. It, it, you know, it, it's like, oh, I, I need to do this thing so I can run over to the studio and I make some tweaks and I send it back to Russ and then I wait to get the, you know, the mixed file back and, it's you know, it's something to do. So it's been fun and it's been interesting, um, you know, learning all the things. I I watched a uh, a webinar that. Uh, oh, what's the name of the microphone company? DSA microphones. It's a, a microphone company I'd never heard of before. Interviewed your buddy, Brad Maddox. Mm. And man, it Brad's was. Oh, but he like we got to get him on the show because there's so much we can all learn from him. But he um, it was DPA microphones just did it. But it, it they talked a little bit about DPA mics, but basically they were just talking about live sound in, in general. And Brad has a Brad. For those of you that don't know, I know Paul knows who Brad is because I think he was the best high man at your buddy, wedding. Man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. High yeah. school pal. High school pal. Um, but he, you know, uh, sound engineer for uh, Florence and the Machine, Rush. Uh, uh, and many, 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 many others. Uh, many I think, others. I think he's supposed to he go out on the road. He did. Okay. He did Hollywood Vampires. He's he did uh, Queens for a lot that's of years. It. Queens yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and Marilyn Manson. He did for several years. He's supposed to go on the road with Motley Crue this summer, as he said in the interview the other day. But you know, obviously, he's sort of expecting that not to happen for all the obvious yeah. reasons. But um, but he mentioned a concept. He he really has a great way of explaining things without being condescending and, and, and also without being too overly technical, but but also not being pedantic. But he did reference a concept that I had never even heard of before called parallel compression. So I'm watching this video and he and the interviewer are talking about how how much they like to use parallel compression. I'm like, what what is this thing? I must know. <laughs> so I researched it, you know, on on uh, on Wikipedia or whatever and dug deep. And the essentially the idea is normally if you're going to run a track through compression, what you get out the other side is the track after the results of compression. And that can get it can be great. And it can also be weird, you know, if you have too much compression uh, and compression being the concept of limiting the dynamic range of your signal. So compressing the loudest part down so that it is not too much louder than the softest part. And obviously you can adjust the parameters to decide what that delta is. Uh, We do a lot of compression here on the podcast so that when we get quiet, we're not actually quiet. You know, it, you can still hear us if you're driving in your car and you have road noise and all that stuff. Uh, but he said he likes to use parallel compression on drums because drums as an instrument, the drum set gets weird with compression. You start to squash the cymbals out in order to get some of the sort of softer details uh, out of the mix. And I'm like, what's this parallel compression? And and really it's, it's a simple concept. The idea is you run your, your drum mix or whatever you're going to do, but you run your, your signal and then you run it through a compressor, but the output of the compressor doesn't replace the original signal. You now have two things. You have a mix of the, the uncompressed drums or uncompressed source, and then you have a mix of the compressed source and you blend them together in parallel, hence the term, and you decide how much of the compressed mix instead of the typical thing where you're getting 100 percent of the compressed mix. You decide maybe I want 30 percent compressed versus uncompressed or I want 60 percent. And it really makes a difference. It totally helps to liven up some some of the drum mixes that are done. So it's just, you know, it's fun. I'm learning, which is great. Brad's really bright. Yeah, Brad, yeah smart guy. Yeah. Very well yeah. spoken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good. So a so, um, couple of things. One, just reacting to what you were sharing. I'm definitely on that roller coaster with you. There's times where like 
this is so hopeless. Am I ever going to get to play music with my friends again? And it, and it just kind of kills your, your creative desire. You know, you, it just feels hopeless. And then there's other times where it's like, well, you know, I'm getting a lot of time with my instrument now. These streams are kind of cool and any kind of little, little project I might do with a friend musician, Simon and I are going to do a Beatles song together, nice. just exchange tracks and put together. Yeah. And those are fun yeah. little things. But then I go back around and it's like, man, this is hopeless. You know, yes. this is like, <laughs> it's, it's six months to a year before I'm going to be able to, you know, hear applause or, you know, see mm-hmm. people smile when I play or, you know, get that tactile feedback. That is what playing live music is about. And it's just, it is pretty weird. But on the other side, the Rolling Stones gave us a little gift last night or two, a couple nights ago. And uh, I, I was going to ask if you saw that and if you had any sense about how they did it. I think it was a straight Zoom meeting. I don't think they did anything technically different. There are enough weirdnesses and lags in certain things that tell me that there's nothing special being done. But um, I'll have to watch it. it. I have not I have not seen it yet. Uh, oh, you got to go see it. OK, yeah, yeah. I've heard I've heard about this, but I haven't. Um, I, like I said, I spent most of the weekend. My music time was spent recording. Um, but uh, it but looks I, to me like they just zoomed. Right. There's nothing special. There's some places where it's not quite lined up. Hmm. I think they purposely picked something that was fairly sparse. So they weren't on top of each other tremendously. Um it's a it's a thing. Yeah, I'd love for you to see it and tell yeah. me what you think about it. OK, yeah, I'll watch it. We'll talk about it next week. I'll or I'll give you my uh, my, you know, my breakdown of it next week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So back to, the, you know, the world of uh, what current gigging is like now, which is, you know, largely streaming, uh, you know, things. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've done a couple more. You know, there's a lot of learning curves. There's a lot of, you know, the, everybody that I know, their stuff is getting better quality um yeah i wanted to talk a little bit today though about what i'm seeing at least in my world about the fans perspective of it right so in in my area in the south bay south san francisco bay area you know and there are a couple bands that have done a couple artists that have done a good job in in earning a following sure in that following there is a certain number and, and there's, you know, a group of, of bands that are friendly with each other sure. that support each other. And one of the byproducts of that is that they are sharing fan bases, right? So they're exposing fan bases to their other friends, groups, and that type of thing. And, you know, there's certainly for the acoustic nights that go on around town here, there's a group of somewhere between 50 to 75 kind of hardcore music fans who are going out to sometimes they have their favorite they support one person more than others but you know if, if that person's not playing they're just certainly likely to to show up and um then there's you know other concentric circles of ca- more casual music consumers live music consumers and then there's the great unwashed the opportunity to kind of get people interested in what you're doing now that this is all kind of distilling down and, and transferring more to this online thing um I know that I'm kind of sensitive that that first concentric circle is certainly getting bombarded with uh, requests, you know, invites sure. to come, come see me, right? Yep. Um, and I was talking with a friend of mine and he was like, you know, it's, it's a little bit weird thing. I want to support, but I still want to enjoy the music and I don't want to feel obligated. But now I kind of feel like if I enter something and, you know, this is largely Facebook live streaming events, you know, although the concept certainly works for YouTube and other things, you know, this fan was saying, you know, I kind of feel like the same seven people are asking me to tip them every night, you know, you know, somebody to tip, it's getting expensive. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I, if, if it's not working for me one night, if I leave a stream, you know, do the artists feel bad and not supported? And so we had a kind of a talk about the fans perspective. um, And, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on it, but I'll start by offering my thoughts is that, you know, and it's, and we, I've said this before, one, the artist needs to earn your fandom. So, you know, if I don't want a relationship with any kind of an obligation feeling, that's not right to me. Right. So I want to be good. And if I'm not good, you should walk out and I, I'll know I got to get better. I got to get better. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, but in the streaming realm, better is a even differently subjective thing because better is now not a, 
environment that most musicians are terribly savvy in. It comes to things like how good is your sound? How good is your lighting? How good is your, do you have any visuals? Um, you know, how good is your set? It's not just about the notes you're playing and singing. Um, it, in, and it takes on an even more dramatic feel uh, when it's coming through a tiny little screen on someone's phone or computer. So there's good as a, has a couple different arms and legs to it now, but also, you know, cover music, you know, how far can you take it? You know, it, I'm streaming at the same time. Elton John is streaming and, you know, all these kind of major artists are, you know, having a presence and, and are doing things fairly regularly now as well. So I just kind of want to get your thoughts and uh, have a little chat <clears throat> about, about what is good uh, about, uh, about uh, st- uh, uh, establishing your brand and your presence and satisfying existing fan bases and stretching it out <clears throat> to uh, to broader fan bases, which I believe is a challenge for a cover artist, unless you are really a great streaming performer. If you're well, someone who can summon happiness, you know, tell a joke between songs or have a personality that really draws people in, like any kind of entertainment. <clears throat> You're going to earn fans almost regardless of the, you know, polka music, you know, jazz music, whatever it might be. So, yeah, so, that, that's yeah, kind of what well, is on my mind. Yeah. So I, I think we need to rewind a little bit and and remember that if this is true, what I'm about to say is true 100 percent of the time, but it is 100 times more true right now. And that's that there's not a divide between artists and fans, except for in a specific performance environment. But when we talk about artists and fans, like especially when we talk about fans, there are artists within that. These are not, you know, separate things. We as as even though I am someone that can consider myself an artist, I can also go and watch other artists and just be a fan. Right. And, And that. But but that has not been an easy thing to do for us because on the nights that we're playing, we can't go to another, can't be in two places at the same time. Can't go to another club, even to check in on a band for 10 minutes on your set break, right? You, you, you're in your club, they're in their club. And that's the end of that. Um, and then, you know, on your night off, you might not want to go out and, you know, get up off the couch and all the things that we talk about. But today like nobody's leaving the couch. You're doing your performance from the couch, you know, or 10 feet away from the couch. You're watching other people from the couch and you could even on your set break, go and check in with other people. So as, as I am more of an active fan nowadays than I normally would be able to be. And I'm, I guess is that that's true of a lot of people that are, you know, performers. Uh, so the good part about that though, is all of these things that you're talking about. And really what we're talking about is, learning to manage the fans expectations. And one really important part of that is trying to put yourself in the shoes of your fans and, and see it from the other side. And you can really easily do that by simply going and watching other people perform. And that's good because you can pick up tips, not money tips, but you know, tips about how to make your performance better, but you can also like, start to experience in a very visceral way, this thing you're talking about where there's the expectation of, Oh yeah, you know, Paul saw me show up. So now I gotta, I gotta make sure that I watch long enough so that when we talk about this, I, you know, I I'm able to to say some things that are relevant and all of that good stuff. And, and, and so there is this expectation, not all that different from what would happen if, you know, I, I walked into a, a room where you were playing, you would see me there. It's the same kind of thing. And so, but you know, that's, I would have to actually get up and leave the room as opposed to just like close the window, open the new window, you know, like that kind of thing. And, and so we need to think about that when we're setting up our own stuff, as you're pointing out here, um, thinking about what these fans are going to want and asking someone you want people to want to enjoy what you're doing. Like that's step one, because you're not going to get anything out of them. If they don't, uh, you might get some sympathy money, you know, from some fans initially, but, but by and large, you want to actually be entertaining, right? Always be performing. However, you can't expect people to be comfortable showing up three nights a week to your streams. If they feel your expectation is that they tip 
every single time or engage in a certain you know uh, way every single time. They need to be comfortable showing you that they are supporting you and then also just casually relaxing, letting their shoulders down and enjoying what's going on without feeling this pressure. So yeah. I, w- I wonder if, you know, if there's, there's a lot of ways to look at this, but I, I wonder if a subscription model is a better model than a tip while you're here model, right? Unless you, you are, again, it's just all about managing expectations. If you, you know, put up your tip jar and just say, look, you know, I'm hoping that you tip once a month or once a week or whatever it is that you. And I think it's really helpful to define what a tip is. I know you never want to set a ceiling and you don't have to, but you can say, look, you know, if you enjoy what I'm doing, I really hope you just put, you know, 10 bucks a month in the uh, in the tip jar. You're welcome to do more than that if you want. But 10 bucks a month would make a really big difference for me. I, that kind of level set now somebody now I can I can say, oh, I'll give Paul 10 bucks a month. That's great. Maybe I'll even choose to do 15. It doesn't matter. But now I know I'm hitting the minimum level I think you expect from me. And now I'm comfortable just showing up and watching without wondering at what point do I feel obligated to re up? I already know you've set that out. And I really think that that as we're talking about this here again, I, you know, I go back to podcasting because so much of what we're doing here is it relates to, to podcasting. And when we, you know, at Mac geek Gab, when we set up our, our, you know, we had listeners that wanted to give us money and they found very creative ways to do it before we opened the door to, sure. to, you know, to, for that. And it was obvious that we needed to do it, but it was like, okay, we need to set some expectations because we want, if you're one of our fans, we don't want you to pay us once. Right. We want you to pay us, you know, over time. So we have to give you a reason to do that. You know, recurring revenue is a good thing. But we also have to make it clear what we expect from you so that you don't feel weird and stop listening, because that would be the worst thing. Listening and not paying is better than not listening at all. Right. And it costs you nothing to have someone listen. Right. Okay, So let me pause you for a couple seconds here. So one is in the back of my head. Now, now I've done three shows. Mm-hmm. One I did uh, as a benefit for a local venue that I play at all the time. So all tips went to them. Great. And two, I just did. And um, no, it didn't ask for tips and sure. mention tips, all those type of things. So I, one side of me is like, well, but I'm the one who's always preaching music has value. So, you mm-hmm. know, it should be exchange of, of my, my trade, you know, my, my work, you know, am I telling people it doesn't have value? I'm struggling with that a little bit, still do. Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, you know, you're talking about the experience and I'm thinking about this kind of core group of people who are being in, at least in my area, who are good music fans and they go out and support live music. Often they're getting, three, four, five, seven invites a week to sure. people that they tend to patronize in one way or another. Um, uh, some of them, you know, I think are financially challenged from this current situation. Um, I think a little bit about my brand and like, do I want to be another person asking them for money in this situation? I don't, I don't technically need it now, but then the other side of me kicks in and says, but music has value. Right. And so it's a little bit of a, you know, damned if you do damned, if you don't situation, it feels a little bit challenging to me. So, uh, and again, what's the number uh, like, I mean, let's, let's go, let's, let's tug on this subscription thread a little bit because we do talk a lot about, well, I want to extract that number a little bit too, because part of the problem is that at least in my area, a lot of the idea that number comes from, well, if the people in the first concentric circle of, of hardcore, you know, music fans gives this, then the second concentric circle of people who kind of know me, know I play guitar, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, one of the things that's been on my mind is you really got to get it up to, you know, at least a hundred people and with goals towards a thousand people right. that have some interest in what you're doing, which is, which is an achievable thing sort of in an online world. Right. Yep. I mean, when Elton John streams, he's got millions of people, you know, listening to him and, and, and you know, paying attention. So, you know, can you as a as a cover artist go beyond your local market of those who know you? Like, is your 
cover of Rocket Man that much different than someone else's cover of Rocket Man that that, that music fans may discover you. Well, I think and you I need to do something different. I I think you I and this is I mean to be fair, this is a conversation that's worth having about when you play live too. Uh, you know, doing covers. How much entertainment do you? Provide? How much? You know, that's what you know. Well, what experience it. are you transcending to the to the consumer? Yeah. And you know how you do it, like you know, yeah, my version of Freebird. Wait, you haven't seen my fastball yet, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, yes, I have seen your fastball yet. It's the same as everybody else. And I've fastball. seen his and his. Right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. And I've seen fastballs fastball, and they do theirs differently. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I, I, I think uh, this is a good opportunity for people to really think about, like, because in addition, th- this is a double edged sword right here. Uh, we have the world, literally the world as our potential audience, right? Everybody that can watch Elton John's stream can watch yours. Don't forget that, right? All you got to do is find these people and convince them to watch. And, and I don't mean to trivialize that. That's the hard part. Well, it's not trivialized because how many people are making ridiculous livings as social media influencers? Yes, you know, because they have whatever skill they have cooking, looking good in a bathing suit, um, you know, painting, you know, whatever it might be. That is the opportunity of our time here is that the, our audiences are infinite. They, they are. But our the flip, audience opportunity flip, is infinite. Yeah. The flip side of that is you now have every, you know, person with a guitar and a microphone or mm-hmm. forget a microphone, a guitar and a cell phone. Uh as your competition too, right? It's not just Elton John. It's everyone. The barrier to entry. I don't want to say it's zero, but if you're listening to this show, it's, it's, it's accurately zero. You're not, there's nothing else you need to do it. Right. And so you've got to really find a way to, to differentiate yourself, but you also need to find a way to market yourself. And, and once people are in the door, you don't want them to leave because they probably won't watch another one of your streams. You know, let me me tell you something that I, that I learned, right? So uh, my last stream, I think I ended up with 2,500 views. I was like, Holy cow, 2,500 views. Sure. Right. That's one data point. Um, the average length of time that people watch my stream was about two and a half minutes. So right. outside of that first circle of people who were like there engaging on the chat, like focused and paying attention, most of the people checked in and said, oh, okay, this is what he does. And, yep. and then took off on their own. Right. Yep. And so, so the, well, here's the, what you can do. If, if you've already got the first circle, right. And your first circle, I know you, 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 you're looking at it geographically, but I think we need to like dispense with that silliness, to be perfectly frank. Uh, you need to look at whatever your first concentric circle is. That's your circle. Don't worry about anybody mm-hmm. else's. It's yours, right? Your worst competition is yourself. So look at that circle and say, OK, how can I leverage my number one group of fans? Right. And, and one part is, you know, a subscription thing. But the other part is ask them to market you. They are the people that are showing up. So, hey, think about, look, I'm going to do this next Thursday. Would you host a watch party here on Facebook and and bring some of your friends in? I think it'd be a blast. Like making that part of the thing and then giving people the entertainment value of something that their friends will say to them, you made a good choice. Thank you for inviting me to this thing, right? Because that's how you're going to get for every I don't know what the number is, but I'm going to say for every 20 people that watch your stream, especially 20 people that are invited by a friend. So, you know, a warm invitation as opposed to a cold invitation, uh, but not you. It has to be someone else inviting you because that adds validation to it. But, you know, for every 20 people, one of those is going to become one of, in you know, in your first circle of fans. And and you just need to keep engaging that first circle. Uh and and really, you know, focus on that. What do they say? You'd rather have a, a thousand true fans than, you mm-hmm. know, than a hundred that whatever that 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 mantra is. Yeah. There, there's truth to this here. You know, you if you have a thousand true fans, you can make a living off of what they can, if you can get them to pay you a hundred bucks a year over a year. That's a hundred thousand dollars a year. hundred thousand dollars. That's it. That's right. So you need a thousand true fans. And if you have 10, that's great. You've already done it. Now do it again. Now go get 20. Now do that again. Now you've got 40. Okay. Now you're moving, right? It, you know, I always say just start with 
Start with something small and and you can grow it. Just don't lose sight of the fact that what you're doing is catering to your number one fans, your number one group of fans. Uh, it And you can do this, but but you need to you need to give them whatever they need to feel validated that you are delivering value and enter and, and here that's the entertainment is, you know, the big thing that you're doing. And but it doesn't have to be only entertainment. It can be something that is unique. Now, if all you're doing is playing cover songs and you aren't going to, you know, branch out into playing originals or whatever, you need to figure out what the thing is that you do that can be unique. And then you got to go hang your hat on that. Uh, and maybe it's that you do cool arrangements. Maybe it's that you have a freaking amazing voice and you're like that Mike Massé guy, right? That, that we all watch sing mm-hmm. Africa, right? He does his live streams now on YouTube and he does like one a week and he gets, you know, tens of thousands of people to watch because he knows. Guarantee he has a thousand true fans. He, correct. He That's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, he's always even even with that. I watch him and. He'll do a set of songs and one of the songs each night is what he calls his preview. And he's like, look, I haven't mastered this song yet. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to play as much of it as I can, but there's going to be a mistake here, you know, and it's fine. But that's part of his brand. That's part of his using this, the medium to get you connected to him, feeling connected to him. Like you're going on this ride with him. You're going on the ride. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, 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 I watch his stuff occasionally. I I think he's got a great voice. He's also a, a, you know, like I think his, his number one band is the Beatles and number two is Rush. Right. So he and I have a lot of musical taste in common. And uh, and he pulls out some weird, like obscure rush tunes to cover. And it's like, oh, I'll go and watch that. And it's like <laughs> it's but it's cool. You know, like he um, it, it, it like I like watching that. I like the way he sings, but he's not doing any of his own material. But he is doing material that resonates with me in a way that resonates with me in a way that I'm not seeing anyone else do it. So and and part of it is he posts his set list after the fact. Right. So I can know what I'm about to go see. And he puts timestamps on them and everything. So I know, OK, at this timestamp, he played, you know, second nature. Great. I want to go watch that. I don't need to watch the rest. But once I watch second nature, I might watch the next tune and the next tune. And now it's rolling and he's he does mm-hmm. his on YouTube. So he's making money from YouTube ads and, you know, good to go. Boom. All set. You, like there's more you can do. And and just doing your set list with timestamps would separate you from 99% of the people that are out there. Have you done that yet? I haven't seen anybody else do timestamps on their set lists after uh, the fact. No. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. And I think that like it doesn't take very long and you go through and do that and now it's like, "Oh, I want to watch Paul sing that song." Well, great. I don't have yeah. to guess. I can just go. And if you're publishing to YouTube, YouTube will it, it, their the way their interface works, if you just put those timestamps in the description in the comments, I, all I have to do is click the time and it fast forwards the video to that point or Ooh. just sets the video to that point. That's so, a great tip. Yeah. Like these, but the, but I wouldn't have learned any of these if I wasn't watching other people. And I think that's the big point here is you've got to go and go be a fan, dive in, be a fan, think of the things and find the things that resonate with you and then go do those things and ignore the rest. Well, of them. Yeah. I'll tell you this, this uh, we have an ongoing conversation on the show about, performing live always be performing yeah. performing is a visual medium it's even a thousand times more important when you get to streaming yeah. right i mean i mean people are not going to stream a video just for the audio i don't think that they are um and uh i think the thing is if you're a musician who has always been kind of a sideman type of person and never kind of had to deal with the focal point of the entertainment uh, message in whatever group you're playing on, you got to figure out how you're going to fit into this streaming world, right? If you want to, if you want to participate in it. I mean, I guess if, I guess, you know, like there, there's a cat who works at a local guitar store. He's a great player. His name's Sam Eigen, E-I-G-A-N. Sam has, you know, done a couple tours with some touring bands around. He's just, he's a great guy and he's a great player. Okay. And he's been posting some wonderful uh, videos. He's also a guitar teacher. Hmm. The close up is on his hands. You don't even see his face. The close up is on his hands, but he's doing like remarkable um, chord melody type things uh, of of all different types of of uh, styles of songs. 
stuff that if you did close your eyes, you would listen to because it's fantastic. But if you're a student or a, you know, a fan of guitar playing, you would want to watch his fingers and how he does what he does. I think sure. it's actually you know quite cool. Um, you know, maybe if you're that good and have something different to offer, then you can be an audible person in a, in a video world, right? right. An audio. Person in the Ma- world. Maybe, I think maybe, maybe harder. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I will tell you this. We have, and we do this for this show too, although we haven't added a video, video element, but um, we have published every single episode of this podcast and Mac Geek Gab and the small business show to our YouTube channel. And there have been a couple like our, our episode where we sort of paid tribute to Tom Petty did phenomenally well on YouTube, uh, you know, 20,000 views or something ridiculous. Right. But by and large, no one listens to those. And that's because YouTube is a video medium. It's mm-hmm. the only video you get when you go and watch our episodes is, uh, you know, the static logo of our show. So my guess is that YouTube doesn't even surface this in search results. Right. Like, let alone you. You'd have to go and seek it out. And some people do. And some people choose to to listen that way. And that's obviously fine. That's why we put it there. Way I said, what, three weeks ago, we started doing the video stream for Mac Geek Gab immediately. Right. You know, it, it's like 10, 20, 30 times the number of people watching wow. versus listening. Well, because I, we're we're playing to that medium. Right. It's like if we're in that if we're in that arena, we need to play and we want people to pay attention to us. Previously, it was like, that's fine. We know they're not going to, but we'll put it here anyway. If we want people to pay attention to us, we have to play the way that people are used to paying attention to that medium. And so I would say even, you know, for your friend, Sam, if he added, you know, if he didn't have video, people wouldn't watch, even though the video is a little, you know, maybe not, it's not the same. That's okay. You know, I think so. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. I think and gotta, my point of course, is yeah. that, you know, it, 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 it is, I feel it's a long shot that you can be an audio star in a video world, but yeah. The more important salient point is uh, what what is your thing, right? You know, like if you're the the established models that musicians can look at. So yes, we can look at other musicians and see how they're what they're doing. But again, there is like what are social media influencers now? And there are there are social media influencers in every freaking field, in business fields, in consumer fields, cooking you know, style, uh, you know, every field, there is a model that musicians can look at and learn from and steal from that uh, can help do things. So, so I'll, I'll just really quickly in the few weeks that we've been doing this, I've definitely seen us go from at least, you know, my friends sticking the camera up and hit and go to worrying about sound and getting good sound into the camera one way or another. Um, and that's, that was one of the earlier problems that, that needed to be solved um, to worrying a little bit about lighting and making sure that you are pre- presenting a clear picture to worrying a little bit about what does the set look like? What's behind you when you're playing? So kind of going down a checklist of audible and visual um, uh, elements that might make things better. And now people are exper- experimenting with a lot of the um, production tools where if you want to have a message pop up, you know, below you that says, please tip to this address yeah. or, you know, those types of things. So all of these things are moving along. I had, I think maybe we'll save it for next week, but, you know, I, I had to deal with four or five of those production tools last week, trying to find the one to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to simply do this. Sure. I wanted a, a as people clicked on the stream. I wanted there to be a welcome graphic that says the show's going to start in a few minutes, you know, that I could create. Yep. I wanted good sound. I wanted a reliable connection. So I, I wanted to do a hardwired connection. So it was, you know, less Wi-Fi uh, riskiness. Yep. Um, I wanted good sound. I wanted it to look good. And then when I was done, I wanted a, a you know, a, a graphic to come up that said, thanks for watching and, you know, be there and let them know the next, my, ne- my next thing. Pretty simple in my, in my realm. And as I was going through the various tools out there, everything from Mimo Live, which is pretty cool, to StreamYard, which was recommended to us by um, Steve Witchell, um, to uh, OBS, which we've been talking about quite a bit, to Switcher Studio. You know, there's there's several solutions out there. 
They all do a little of it easily, a little bit of it hard, a little bit of it free, a little bit of it. That's exactly paid, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And there's so, no. You know, it's the like toolkits. I want. Yeah. When I started with Mimo, I had used OBS for the first week of our our Mac Geekab thing, and then I switched and tried Mimo, and it was like, oh, I want, but I want these parts of OBS, but I I want them to live inside Mimo, and it was like, oh, I need to just think about it. Like you need to. Uh, it's hard. When you have, a, you know of a way of solving a problem in that app, and now you need to adopt this app's new yep. paradigm. It's sort of a normal thing with software, right? It's it's just how it goes, but it is frustrating when you're in that moment of like, I know how to do this over there. I just want to do it. Yep. So, yep. 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 So it's we continue crazy. to learn. We do. We do. We do. We yep. learn the technical stuff and we learn the performing stuff and they're, they're, they are both important to this medium. I think so. Other people, yeah. other people are figuring the, those things out and putting a lot of polish on what they're doing. And um, and uh, if we're going to be not able to do, be performing, you know, I don't know how long you think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a pretty long time. Yeah, um, my, people are going to want to stand next to each other and you know enjoy and consume live music together. Yeah, I I mean it, I can make a prediction, but it's it's based on all the same information all the rest of us have has, which is to say. I have no freaking idea, but um, my guess, well, you know, is it's not going to be tomorrow or next month. Correct. I think by this fall, we will be at a point where we will have, you know, gatherings of 50 to 100 people are OK, but not more than that. I don't think 500 is going to be OK. I think I think that's next summer at best. Tr- truly, you know, when we can get 500,000 thousands of people uh, I think we will not have a, a major, you know, league sports season as we know it this year. I think there will be there might be games played in stadiums, but they will be empty stadiums uh, mm. is my prediction. I, I think, you know, we'll they'll, they, they'll put TV crews in there and, and sell them to us on our couch, which is would be smart. But I don't think there's going to be people in the stands. Um, I think that that's probably not a thing. And I think the same for concerts now. I think it, regardless of the timing of it, um, barring some miraculous thing where, you know, it, a a switch is flipped and there's no more concern of, of you know, this thing. I, I think it will be a gradual reintroduction to, you know, social uh, gatherings. And I think that's going to be really good for us local musicians because, you're not going to be able to go see, you know, a concert with 15,000 people. You're not going to be able to go see a smaller concert with a thousand people. You're going to be able to go to a place where there's 50 to a hundred people is going to be my guess. And I think that's going to last for a little bit. And that is perfect for us local musicians. So I, we'll see. I think I mean, there's it opportunity. Would be fun. Yeah. It would be fun to put on our, our amateur economist hats and kind of right. like fade this out because, you know, here in California, in New York, we're several months away, right? Right. Oh, and, I think everywhere. And the question yeah. is, is, can these venues hold on? And will there be right. any, or, or is well, everybody starting to venue, Venues, stuff? no. The, the, some venues won't hold on. Some will. And that, in and of itself, creates opportunity, right? Like, the, when we can get back together, there there will be folks that either have been able to keep their businesses afloat or start a new business when that time comes. I mean, I, there will be venues to play, uh, and, but I think it's going to be a little bit different. I think, but if we get to 25% unemployment, will people have money to go out and pay a cover charge? People will want to go out beer? and I, I don't disagree with that. You know but, what I mean? You know, like they, these are things that people spend their money on. And, and I think be going out and socializing will suddenly become a much greater priority than it has been in recent years, because mm-hmm. it's a thing that we have been prohibited from doing right now. Right. So I, I think, I think we will see a, a, a sort of a resurgence there, but again, when that happens, how it happens, pff, your guess is as good as mine. I know. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I have one tip to share with you, Paul, because you mentioned, setting up your Facebook stream so that, you know, you have like a little graphic and then you play and then it ends. Right. And you have like maybe another little graphic. Um, We do the same thing on Mac geek gab. We, but we'll get together for maybe 20 minutes before the show actually like before we hit record on the audio show that we send out like this one, just like you and I do. Right. But we've always streamed our pre-show and our post-show and we do it audio and we've been doing that video. 
but it's yeah. kind of messy. Like it, the stream is great if you're there in the moment because it's a little, it's a lot more interactive. You know, we're interacting with the chat room. We're talking through things, but it's kind of boring to watch unless that's your thing to watch. The majority mm -hmm. of the audience is not into that. And I realize that's very much going to be true with the video too. So just like we cut out the uh, pre-show and post-show and only share with you the actual show, uh, I've been doing that with our Facebook and YouTube videos, and it's worked out great. And they both have the ability to trim a video. Uh, mm -hmm. Facebook's is way easier than YouTube's, shockingly. Uh, but That's the creator studio or the live studio or something like that? No, you just go in. in the Well, in YouTube, they call it YouTube Studio or YouTube Creator Studio now, I guess. But yeah. In Facebook, uh, really, all you're doing is going and editing your video uh, and on either platform. But on Facebook, once you've recorded your live or, you know, streamed your live thing, it keeps yeah. your video. Go to edit that video. And one of the options you'll have, you can edit clips. You don't necessarily want to do that, although maybe you do. Maybe you want to grab, you know, individual songs and share them. And that's what that's for. But you can go and trim your video so that it maybe only has five seconds of your <laughs> Right. Of your, you know, your intro thing and then maybe five seconds of the outro thing so that people aren't having to scrub around like, when did he start playing? It's like, no, I don't, you know. So just bear that in mind that you can and should, I think, do that and really package it up for people. Then go do your timestamps. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. yep. So. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, add to your tip and I'll just tell you yeah. my experience from last week. One of the other things I wanted was I wanted to take advantage of Facebook's scheduled scheduled live feature, because if people interact with that post over the course of a week, they get a reminder you're go that your guy is going live now. I think that's a pretty good thing, right? Yeah. And uh, so I scheduled a Facebook live. It has been wonky on me in the past. And um, the other thing is that when you use this, when you schedule a Facebook live, it doesn't allow you to then start the live from a mobile device. Weird. Right. I get, but very weird. So mm -hmm. I had to, as I'm you know, learning in real time, I decided I, and I also wanted that rock solid connection wired from ethernet. And so I decided to make the trade off. I'm going to, it's important for me to try and get the, understand the, the promotional value of a scheduled Facebook live, but that mean I had to do it on my laptop, yes. my MacBook air, yes. which meant I had to use, cause I don't have another camera. I had to use the built in camera on the MacBook Ooh, air, which 15 was frames a second. That's no more and, no. and something really, really weird qualitatively happened to the sound that was recorded. So mm. I got nothing but praise about the sound while it was streaming live, but whatever got recorded to Facebook was miserable. And so I'm pretty much ready to punt on that whole Facebook live. And, you know, of all the trade offs that, that I had to put up with that and just kind of do the regular old promotion type of thing and, you know, just try and get the word out about it. But, oh, and, and just um, stream. That 15 frames per second thing is a killer. The qualitatively oh, yeah. it's a killer. Yeah. Your so phone, I can buy a, I can buy a better camera. Yeah. And you probably no. should. Yeah. I can do that. Or, or, you know, the thing about, about the Mimo live tool that I'm really liking and, and, and uh, I believe OBS has this as well. The Mimo live tool is really cool because I can get an app, put it on my phone hardwire my phone to my laptop so I'm not creating any additional Wi-Fi traffic and use my phone's camera, which is, you know, a, 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 a good, um, it's a better camera uh, than the one in your computer for sure. App, much better. Yeah. yeah. You can so, get a USB anyway. camera. I've, I've had really good luck, um, with the Logitech cameras. The one I'm mm -hmm. using now is called the Logitech Brio. It's a mm -hmm. 4k camera. The nice part about right. that is, you can zoom in on yourself and still have a really nice 1080p or even 720p signal um, because you've got all the extra data coming in from the camera. The Brio is 200 bucks. That's like Logitech's sort of high end uh, of, of, you know, webcam, if you will, streaming camera. But they have others. You know, they've got their um, the, the, like the, the C930 is like 120. The C920, which I used for years, is 80 bucks. That's a great camera, too. So um, I'll put the Brio and the C920 in, in the show notes just so you folks can, cool. can kind of see them. But, yeah, these are it, it makes it will you will be shocked at the difference that you'll get out of a decent yeah, camera. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right bro. Uh, well, now now it's time for us to uh, to say goodbye, I think. So there you go. Yeah. Take support some ground today. Yeah, we have actually we have some questions that we didn't even get to. So we'll. Uh, 
we'll get to those next time because you know that's what we're well we, we will be here next time i promise <laughs> you know it's what well i mean i, I hate to promise because you never know the future but that's our plan we have we have no plans otherwise so wash your hands wash your hands yeah that way we can all be here next week it's kind of how that how this works <sighs> craziness man always be always Thanks for listening, everybody. Tell a friend, would you? Yeah.